This is Professor Ariel Ortiz Lagardere broadcasting from the International Bariatric Club Studios in San Diego, California. The theme of today's IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery exclusive event is Laparoscopic Surgical Stapling Technology Under the Microscope and will feature experts from Germany, China, Guatemala, Poland, Austria, the United Arab Emirates, the United States, India, Kuwait, Jordan, and Brazil. We would like to thank our partners Zoom Video Communications, YouTube, Facebook, and Bariatric News for setting up and promoting this event webinar, which is sponsored by our platinum sponsors, ConMed, Medtronic, Ethicon Endosurgery, CMR Surgical, Lexington Medical, Panther Healthcare, our gold sponsors, Reach Surgical, Carl Stortz, Bariatric Solutions, Baxter, Advanced Medical Solutions Liquiband Fix 8, Feng Medical, our silver sponsors, Mass Bariatric Technologies, Richard Wolf. This webinar is streaming to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, via Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, the IBC Twitter feed, LinkedIn, and via IBC Instagram. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant, bariatric surgeon, and director of IBC Global Education, based at Chelsea Westminster Hospital, Imperial College, London, and Christchurch, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Dr. Christine Steer from Germany, and will be moderated by Professor Carl Miller from Austria and the United Arab Emirates, and Professor Phil Schauer from the United States. And uh, let's start off by presenting uh, Professor Phil Schauer. He is not only a good friend and an international expert, he's also co-founder of International Bariatric Club. Phil, it's an honor to have you with us so he can present our first presenter. Thanks, Ariel. It's once again uh, an honor to be part of another great IBC uh, broadcast, bringing very important information to surgeons across the globe, particularly um, in this very challenging time. So I'm very happy to be part of, of this particular um, session on surgical stapling, which is really the core of what we do as surgeons. And I'm happy to introduce our first speaker who is a friend and colleague of mine for many years, Dr. Marina Curian, who is very well known uh, to this audience of surgeons across the globe. Uh, Marina is a clinical associate professor at New York University Grossman School of Medicine. Uh, she is an outstanding bariatric and minimally invasive surgeon. She has been in many, many leadership roles in many societies, particularly the executive council of ASMBS, and she is the immediate past president of the New York State Chapter of the American College of Surgeons. And she's gonna talk about the characteristics of the perfect, the perfect laparoscopic stapler. Take it away, Marina. Thank you so much, Phil. Thanks for the introduction. I wanna thank IBC as well for allowing me to, um, uh, let's see, if I this. okay. For allowing me to participate. And I just wanna share my screen and then also make it into, uh, why is it not going into slideshow mode? Hold on one second. Here we go. All right. So I got tasked, I think, the easiest talk of this group. And um, I'm looking forward to all the subsequent talks because I'm going to bring up some of the elements that are necessary, I feel, for a perfect stapler. And I want to give you some of my disclosures because I think, and I'll mention this later, you know, um, what's perfect can also be, you know, where if you're consulting for someone or you always want to check people's disclosures. So 
Um, my honoraria are with uh, two of the state fund companies, and um, but it is for consulting or for teaching. And I don't believe it's going to impact significantly my talk because, again, we're talking about the perfect stapler. So the American um, uh, uh, Surgery Journal in 2019, there's this great article about the history of stapling. I had no idea myself that in 1908 in Hungary, Fischer and Hultl made the first stapler. I can't even imagine at the time, right? But it was bulky and it was very expensive to make. And then this uh, gentleman named Petz, who was working with Hultl, created the Petz Club in 1920, basically because the uh, making improvements on what was there. And I think that's a key to uh, what we look at when we see stapler evolution is improving based on the feedback from the people who are using it. So in 1920, he made one that was more lightweight. And then in 1934, there are closer variations to our modern linear stapler that we use for open surgery. And then of course, in the 1950s, it was another Cold War, Russian and American models of staplers that were coming out. Uh, and so this is just some of the history. So we went from bulky and heavy to requiring things that were versatile, that staplers could be going across from different aspects of the body uh, and, and in use in different tissues. And so the different cartridges were very key. The shapes were very important uh, from linear to circular. And this was really based off a collaboration between Dr. Felician Steichen, Mark Ravage, and also Leon Hirsch. And I think um, something that also happened is if you only have one stapler in the market, right? And, and first it was, um, if anyone remembers Tyco, it was Tyco and, and uh, US Surgical. And uh, anyway, the cost was what it was because they could set it. But then when uh, J&J &J became, became in the market, the cost has changed. And now there are uh, probably in this country, uh, in the US anyway, four major players, but I know around the world, there are other stapler companies as well. Um, and I'm not naming them by name just because, you know, they were actually all of our sponsors <laughs> for this IPC session. So what are some of the things that are important when you talk about stapler? So this was actually a, tish, a screen grab from one of the um, uh, stapler company's websites looking at uh, tissue slippage and if that's important um, when you're applying a stapler. So that's one consideration that when you clamp down on the tissue, if it moves as the stapler fires or if the compression is adequate to keep the tissue in place, does that matter? And I think that's debatable um, and also something that they've done studies on, and you'll see that it may not be the most important thing. Is it important if you have to use multiple fires to complete your um, anastomosis or your uh, division of tissue? Does the stapler height matter? I would say that it does matter, but always check what your stapler height is in the closed position. They always talk about what it is in open, but you want to know what the thickness is when that stapler closes around tissue. And I think that for me is an important aspect. Ergonomics. Ergonomics and stapler is very important, um, but yet when you search on, uh, I did three searches for ergonomics on uh, pure stapler companies uh, sites and there was nothing really about ergonomics of stapling, which is important as we move forward uh, in, in, in surgery, mainly because of not everyone has a size eight hand or seven and a half hand, right? So this is a paper from Surgical Endoscopy. I tried to uh, circle the date, it's 2004. Um, and this, this I've been in, in this surgical field since you know 1998 and there've always been articles about this uh, throughout, but this one struck me because it really uh, was a survey of a fair number of surgeons, laparoscopic. And bottom line is your glove size would signify a, a significant more um, difficulty with different laparoscopic instruments, but also in particular laparoscopic staplers. And this was 2004, manufacturers should look at um, hand size when designing future surgical instruments. I couldn't agree with you more, um, the authors more, and I can tell you right now that it's, it's still an issue. Um, and it's an issue, the reason we're searching for the perfect stapler, the perfect endoscopic, uh, or laparoscopic instrument is because 
as surgeons, we really are going into battle every day. We're in, in, for us with our bariatric patients, we're moving them physically and, and with our arms, with our forearms, or, or if you're using a robot, maybe you're not doing that, but still the, the process of grasping instruments, the strength that we apply, and then the, the method that we have to position our hands to try and hit either like when we're doing endoscopy, hit the wheel and to get the flex, et cetera. Um, all of those things impact on the longevity of, of our surgical careers. And that's coming from someone who has uh, probably bilateral carpal tunnel uh, symptoms and bilateral ulnar sensitivity. So uh, all of these instruments definitely matter. When we talk about innovation, um, what's out there right now, and you're going to hear about powered staplers and uh, probably about robotic staplers, so I'm not going to get into that. But these are definitely innovations that can help I have a colleague who will not use um, a handheld stapler anymore for laparoscopy because of carpal tunnel. So uses only a powered stapler. Um, and also, as you'll hear, these staples are coming up with some methods to address uh, com adequate compression and uh, division of tissue. I really look at this curved stapler for the low and anterior and rectal surgery as probably one of the most innovative things that would happen. For 20 years, we had this straight thing that we had to put across the lower part of the colon and try and get it angled and in position. And it, it just was never great. And I don't do colorectal at all, but I've had uh, occasion to help my colleagues. And so when they first pulled this out, I was like, what is this? This is this. I mean, why did it take 20 years? We should have had this, you know, 15 years ago, but now as more and more colorectal surgery is becoming laparoscopic, this is uh, you know, a, a beautiful uh, example of innovation. There's gonna be a talk on this, so never fear, I'm not gonna get into it. I just do think that the, per the perfect stapler should have ease of management of misfires or, or uh, failures because you have to then figure out how to repair it. Uh, we've all seen those scary videos of, of, um, of of staplers that you know you just you just stop doing uh, and taking off. There's one study just to go back for a second on uh, the misfires. There are some studies talking about misfires and and saying what it is in the U.S. But then there was another study looking at a survey of surgeons and they said they all have had one. I've had a misfire. I, I managed to recover from it uh, without incident. But you know um, the misfires when they happen, they test your ingenuity uh, as a surgeon. And I think the other thing about staplers is we all have to look at the outcomes. Who did the study? Is it somebody, did it come from the company itself? Because I, I want more information than just from the company. They're always gonna tell you that it's, it's great. Um, did your colleagues do the study? Are they actually also paid um, consultants for the company that they did the study? Is there a, a cohort? Is the study balanced? I think all those things are important to look at. And also, is it just bench? Was it in vivo? Was it human study? I think matters as well. Uh, and as I mentioned already, you know, what are the disclosures? So in summary, uh, for me, the perfect stapler, and this is something I didn't mention in my talk, but it has to be easy to load. I, and, and all of us suffer from having the best team in the operating room, and then they go to break and you get somebody else, right? Right in the middle of whatever you're doing. And so that person who comes in has to, really know how to load the equipment. And uh, so ease of um, loading and ease of use is important. Um, you need to have for a perfect stapler, something that gives a platform, but you can have multiple different types of reload as we all experience when we do our sleeves or bypass that different tissues need different um, uh, height on the stapler. Has to be reliable, meaning it can't misfire a lot. It shouldn't misfire early on in, when you start using it because uh, you know, there have been some issues with introduction of new technology where the staplers uh, were not as reliable. Um, cost containment is key. I think if you have a super expensive stapler you, and it's the best one in the market, you're probably not gonna be able to get to use it because of the constraints of our uh, hospital systems. Ergonomics is super important. Um, you know, at this point with laparoscopy, I've been doing it since 1998 full time. And, uh, you know, there's a shelf life for my, my limbs, really, to, to make this happen. 
Um, and I think it's something that we've all experienced and we all just live with. But ergonomics certainly could help to minimize a lot of the repetitive injury that we see uh, from laparoscopy. And then ultimately, I think the perfect stapler really has very reproducible results. And that's why you choose it, you know? Okay, that's it. That's my talk. So I'm going to stop the share. I think well, now Charlie uh, should ask you questions, Marina. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I am so far, Marina. I take, the, I take the liberty. You mentioned one thing that's ergonomic. Uh, and ergonomics, my, my glove size is six and a half as well as. And uh, I understand perfectly what, you, what you're talking about. <clears throat> but in addition, our mobile disease patients, especially when it comes to long lasting surgeries, uh, th those uh, we those situations we hardly can can change. So on on the other hand, uh, from my side, uh, I really didn't uh, experience significantly problem with my small hands uh, when it comes to stapling devices. Uh, but I understand that manual firing needs a force, and especially when you work a longer time, uh, you, you really get tired, and and then you move your stapler while you fire. And that is something which we will hear most probably in one of the next presentations uh, will, be, will be not in favor uh, deploying staples perfectly. So, so that is one. The other uh, topic you focused and that was really amazing, great and important is the misfiring. But I would also emphasize on misuse. Because I have the privilege uh, as I work in Middle East to, to uh, review really a lot of videos where there were complaints of misfirings. And all of the videos that I reviewed were misused. And there are so many details that, that you can uh, really uh, you, uh, misuse in your stapling device that I developed uh, a, a safety checklist before firing. Because if you turn your instrument, if you have a tension uh, you mentioned also tissue slippage. That, that was great. Uh, so your presentation gave, gave everything what, what has to be said from, from your topic. So from my side, it's, it's really difficult to ask you something because your presentation was really excellent. And, and from my side, uh, I, I will not ask more than that. Uh, we really have also uh, to, to force the industry more that we get better training on especially uh, the new devices. Because you mentioned uh, the old devices that we used 30 years ago, they were really very robust. But now uh, the powered devices, uh, those are really high fancy end uh, products, which really uh, needs a perfect training. And, and that is something we, we, we should more emphasize on. So thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation. And I think for the, for the sake of time, maybe we have at the end of uh, the presentations a little bit more for the round table on topics. I would like to, uh, to introduce Raj Balan Yapan, I hope I expressed the name uh, correct. He's professor of surgery at the Savita Medical College in Chennai, India. He's director of the Institute of Bariatrics Apollo Hospitals, uh, Chennai, India, a member of the Executive Council on Obesity and the Metabolic Surgery uh, Society of, of India. So I would like to, to uh, ask um, Raj, uh, could you start with your presentation uh, and uh, give us an insight about that? Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. We can hear you perfectly. You can share your screen and, uh, and start with the lecture. Absolutely great. Okay. Hi. So, uh, a very good uh, speak by Dr. Marian. And to continue with that, I would like to speak about the most interesting part of uh, laparoscopy as such, the most important part of laparoscopy as such when it comes to tissue approximation, but the most under, uh, how to say, like uh, spoken about or uh, under researched about topic is staple misfire 
and its identification and management. I bring greetings from Apollo Hospitals, India, and I have nothing to declare. There's no conflict of interest from my part. To go with the background, we all know from literature that there's a 0.1 to 5.6% of leak in a laparoscopic bariatric surgery and misfire being the common reason that's been in literature said everywhere. The reason why there has been a misfire in spite of having so much of a technological advancement is improvement in the existing device constantly, as well as a new introduction of devices, which makes it much more difficult for a surgeon to really cope up with the technology companies. And of course, there has been a discussion, I mean, a, a point noted by uh, uh, told by Dr. Uh, Marian before about uh, that no, no economics being available for uh, stapling devices. Uh, that gives a very collective knowledge gap on the basics of uh, stapling that leads to misfire. And of course, the most uh, important thing is about there has always been an anecdotal evidence uh, based practice of stapling and not uh, economic or uh, physiology based practice, which needs to change. And of course, it is also related to the surgical experience also. Coming to identification, <clears throat> there are some few points which I like to really make people understand. It depends on six major factors, the firing pressure, the tissue creep, tissue milking, staple form, bleeding, and then uh, some technical issues. So based on these parameters, we can identify that there's something going wrong. When it comes to firing pressure, it depends on tissue thickness, tissue viscosity, which includes water, air, and, and, and the tissues, and then the blade quality. That's exactly why the people say that don't use reuse a stapler, use a new stapler every time. So if the firing pressure normally will have a single hand uh, pressure to do a manual stapling and uh, uh, you know, uh, mechanical stapling will smoothly go through without much of a resistance. And with the new addition of uh, artificial intelligence in stapling, of course, we uh, you know, avoid this kind of uh, uh, firing pressure issue of late because they stop firing. If you have to use two hands to fire, that means there is some problem with the pressure, there is something wrong. If we still did that, expect a misfire, check for the misfire. The next identification point is the tissue creep. What exactly is tissue creep is if we try to crush a tissue by giving so much of a compression pressure in spite of tissue not accommodating between the jaws of the stapler, then the creep happens where you can have a fracture of the tissue. So it also it's dependent on the thickness of the tissue, stapler height, and then if there's any tissue overlap, when there is a double dressing of the tissues. So when there is a creep, when you release the, uh, uh, the stapler, which you see in the right hand side of the picture, you expect a misfire and try to analyze them. Then what we call as a tissue milking, due to adhesions or unintended structures like Riles tube or maybe a stapler in between or a croc stapler, there could be some kind of uh, hindrance to the firing capacity of the stapler and stapler, in spite, instead of trying to staple it, because the blade is finding it very tough and giving enough pressure, too much pressure, it will milk. Any milking beyond one millimeter will have a misfire. So what happens is, in this scenario, you have to be pretty careful that there will be a misfire happen. In the, in the, see the video here, it really milked to about some two millimeters. And once you release this kind of a thing, you will tend to see uh, uh, a misfire at the edge of the staplers. So you have to be very, very careful about this. So these are very interesting identification point where we can understand that there could be something wrong with the fire. And you are evident with that in this video. Then the staple form. Staple form is a bit difficult to identify so easily, but then when there's a clean stapler line seen around both the sides, a straight line in three rows in the front and two knobs around in the back, then you think that it has formed well. But then we can find one or two staplers which are uh, you know, into the abdominal cavities. Those are not formed well. Then you think about some kind of a misfire. This also depends on tissue thickness. 
and then across stapler height as well and then unendon structure so tissue thickness and stapler height plays a very very big role in these kind of a situations then of course very easy to predict when there is a bleeding after your stapling there could possibly be a misfire maybe a very bad misfire and causing bleeding from the edges of the staple line of course with high incidence in staple line and there is no analytical data comparing how much how often a bleeding happens in a staple misfire but prediction wise maybe 50 70% of the scenarios there will be some bleeding and of course integrity of staple line has to be checked when there is a bleeding sometimes there can be tissue creep and and, and crushing of the tissue but you might not be able to identify misfire when you see for integrity you might identify them then of course a technical failure a mechanical failure of the stapler is about 20% of times as per data and of course it also depends on tissue thickness staple height and uh, unintended structure so basically if you choose the wrong stapler if you choose the wrong thickness of the uh, you know unprepared bowel or stomach you might have some kind of a trouble coming to management <clears throat> there are few steps again a six point management safety assist can be done a medial stapling tissue release suture closure reinforcement and a conversion surgery when come technical steps there are few points which you need to see first is we try to release the button when it's technically stuck and you're not able to take it out if still not able to do maybe you can release the cartridge lock reverse see if it getting released otherwise the firing safety knob can be moved out so that you can reverse the firing and you can take it out sometimes the articulating joint can be stuck and uh, so this will be pretty difficult to technically uh, avoid still there are plenty of ways to address it this is a, a video of uh, dr koji park uh, presented in stages at all where he had some kind of a, a technical issue where we, he tried to release the lock not able to do it so he unloaded the uh, stapler and then immediately went in and stapled and completed the sleeve gastectomy so to make sure that there is uh, uh, no constriction because of bougie inside and then outside try to release the firing now uh, i mean that the indicator so it's it's a typical uh, technical uh, mechanical mistake of the stapler and this is uh, from my unit we try to do a sil sleeve gastectomy where we got our stapler completely stuck where we have couldn't find any other way so we try to release the tissue and you see the tip of the thing is not fired fortunately we had a, a, a little bit of a tissue left laterally so we went immediately and stapled it and continued with the stapling technique and completed the uh, 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 firing so this way at least you know either a medial thing or a tissue release can help you to complete of course uh, a methylene blue test or any other endoscopy or any other ways of leak test is very important in these kind of scenarios once we do this firing then other is a suture closure and this is a typical where we see the bleeding and the bleeding indicates that there is some kind of a, a misfiring and you can see the staple half of staple is not fired well and you have a big rent in it so the best way here is to continue with the uh, sleeve gastectomy or any procedure what you're doing complete the procedure come back and then you can do suture closure over a buji so that you don't constrict too much and this way you can make sure that you arrest the bleeding as well as well as the uh, close of the rent staple line reinforcement of course there are a study the study by carlos uh, published in 2018 that between a suture and buttress for a reinforcement of stapling after a misfire with uh, something with the umbilical patch as well they do not affect the leak pressure but however there is improvement in integrity of the tissue so stapler line reinforcement might help better than just doing a stapler when you have misfire and of course there has been literature with sub, with, with conversion of a sleeve gastectomy to a rvgb a sleeve jejunostomy to release the pressure of the, uh, the, the the gastric pressure oagb or a diverted oagb but there's a very positive for data to uh, uh, you know to say how much it's going to help in the long run the last part of the topic the prevention part stapler check has to be done for all the cases so get a new stapler every time check them for all the joints jaws articulation everything is functioning or not then go for the 
right cartridge when it comes to right cartridge we should know the anatomy perfectly well a normal fundus will be around 1.6 to 2.3 to the body and the uh, distal body will 2.7 and antrum will be around 2.1 so for our antrum normally the staples that we use are a green a gold or a purple whereas when come to the body and fundus people have to choose between a purple gold or a blue which is the common uh, consensus across the globe for stapling when it comes to revision the same fundus body and antrum can be much more thicker with 2.2 at the fundus 3.5 at the body and distal body 3.8 and antrum can be 4.5 so for these reasons try to use green black or in some cases we can use purple as well for the antrum coming to the body and fundus gold green or purple is the best for the revisions comes to stapling of the small bowel since jejunum and ileum are very thin 1.4 or 1.2 to 1.4 when it's in revision it can be a maximum of 2.6 we can be done with white staples if it's a primary or blue or gold or or, or a tri stapler when you want comes to a revision or or as a common for every rule then comes the jaw alignment this is one interesting part between linear and articulating we prefer articulating because it goes well with the ergonomics of the stomach but the greater the articulation the greater the risk of misfiring especially when you are reusing it because the jaw might not sync well between the anvil and 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 and, and the jaw so that the firing might not happen perfectly and of course reuse adversely affects the b formation so you have to be careful about that then the ergonomic gripping one interesting concept here is there is a small difference between the ergonomic nature of the two major companies uh maybe uh, echelon and uh, endo gas endo gas has a stable anvil and a rot and a moving cartridge end whereas ethicon has a stable cartridge and a moving anvil segment so for this reasons the technique has to be a bit different between both the staplers but wherever possible try to have the indicator in the front this is a big ergonomic uh the thing which is not been practiced mostly basically because they wanted to have the anvil up and have the cartridge with curved edges so that they don't want to inadvertently injure the tissue uh, in the, in the, 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 the behind it but idly speaking these indicators are there to make sure that we can see how we have fired whether we did the full firing or not so for this reason better to have this kind of ergonomics in gripping to prevent a misfire and of course compression load you know how much thick tissue you are holding with experience that tissue inherent properties are there maybe antrum might be a bit thicker body might be a bit easy to uh, uh, compress but current physical condition has to be assessed as well whether there is edema whether you are unprepared bowel unprepared stomach accordingly you choose the stapler so the compression load will not be too high otherwise they'll have a tissue creep then the compression time which is called as a stress relaxation a, a stomach beautifully compresses by about 0.5 mm with 15 second compression and that is the reason why they say you to reduce the displacement force of firing by having a stress relaxation by increasing the compression time to 15 seconds and again there has been studies just proved that tissue creep will happen if there is a longer compression time so around 15 to 20 seconds is what it has been recommended and the same uh, in an example in a, in a in a in vitro lab j and j cut to see this video they showed that without displacement the same uh, stapler can have a misfire so stress relaxation is a pretty important part of a good uh, you know uh, firing technique and of course migratory crotch staple this is one of the reason of for tissue getting stuck I mean the, the stapler getting and then the milking of the tissue happens so it's a very common occurrence remove the crotch stapler otherwise milking happens and sometimes stapler can get locked also and you are stuck without able to do anything and before i complete i would like to uh, present this ibcs survey with within 2018 among 301 surgeons through our uh, 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 velocity website about the stapling so we had surgeons about some more than 50% surgeons have more than 5 years experience Uh, and more than 10x experience as well and they had more than 1000 more than 30 37% of more than 1000 surgeries in experience when we asked a question about how often they faced misadventure less than 
is the last mean the, the most of the people have less than 1% in their uh, stapling misadventure but the commonest misadventure when we ask them more than close to 50% of them say staple misfire and again to reiterate this staple misfire is mainly because of some kind of ergonomic mistake and not exactly the technological mistake because only 20% is technological mistake rest 80% is ergonomic mistake which can be addressed and they also said you no know, like a, a common consensus they commonly use blue for primary uh, at the body and green at the antrum and at the fundus again blue and when it comes to uh, uh, bypass sleep that the bypass they used blue for the pouch and uh, blue for the gg i mean uh, gastroenterostomy and then enterostomy they use white commonly which is uh, regularly what they been consensus as well to conclude i would like to say presumably the most common cause of leak is misfire learn the technology better by using the staples check functions for every before every loading and of course understand the tissue physiology before starting to choose the stapler and work based on stapler tissue interaction of course this bridges the knowledge gap thank you thank you so much rush for this uh, perfect absolute perfect uh, presentation about staplers and uh, i really was thinking all the time what i should ask you <laughs> but <laughs> Maybe one question, especially uh, in sleeve gastrectomy, which distance to the bushy do you recommend uh, so that you can really fire safely your stapler? I'm looking at you. Which distance? The distance from the bushy. Do you think you should go very close to the bushy? Is this a problem? May this a problem for misfiring? Yes. See, because the stomach has three layers of muscle. Whenever you go tight to any structure, we don't know which layer of the muscle gets stretched more can be sometime longitudinal sometime oblique sometime so what happens is this will cause a lot of zigzag and that can cause twist and sometimes misfire also can happen when you try to tighten too much so i will say 0.5 to 1 cm lateral to the bougie is where you fire in for that reasons if you want it you can have a a, a, a bigger bougie as well but then don't go too tight to make the muscles stretch that will not give us straight line stability thank you um and uh, another question is um what do you recommend uh, you you showed us a lot of nightmares uh, during surgery but what do you recommend uh, if you have a misfiring in in the sense of you caught the bushy with a okay. stapler <laughs> <laughs> yes there has been videos circulating about people get, get getting the buji so that's what i said in identification if the compression pressure is too high you should know that you are catching something which is not supposed to be this will comes with experience but if you get caught with it the only way to you know, do it is maybe you put a intraotomy try to remove that and then if the if, if the wound is too big maybe convert it to a rvgb otherwise you might end up in a in a big trouble with stricture and that again leads to leak and plenty of complications later because you might have a good junk of uh, uh, stomach gone and i suspect there could be a possibility of a stricture later if you try to repair it primarily thank you so much this was really a perfect presentation uh, of of the topic and um, it 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 was um, it, it showed really that uh, let me say keep calm under pressure that's uh, the best i can say it that's true <laughs> thank you so much so now it's my absolute honor to present a uh, well known and famous professor cory mcbride from the us she's a professor of surgery uh, at the university of nebraska medical center she is leading and uh, the the, uh, the director of bariatric services and what is most impressive she is physician champion for medical informatics nebraska medicine so she will talk about automatic laparoscopic staplers is it a game changer or splitting hairs thank you so much cory the stage is yours thank you very much um so yes 
So I have no disclosures, but I did want to point out, I did reach out to the major powered staple companies and ask them to provide me their internal literature. Because as Dr. Kurian pointed out, there's actually very little published literature on all of this. So some of this, what I'm going to share actually comes from the companies themselves, but I received no compensation for use of this literature. I wanted to share with you kind of what I have learned. So we'll start with Ethicon, and I am naming the companies so you can tell who provided me their literature. Basically, Ethicon has had a powered stapler since 2011, and they refined it in 2014 into their current version, which is the Plex. Uh, the Flex GST. But in addition to being a powered stapler, they also made some updates to the cartridges and to the staples themselves, trying to improve their technology, including adding some grips to the cartridges themselves to try to pre prevent some of the slippage that the previous speaker mentioned. And by changing the actual confirmation of the staples themselves, the goal is that the staplers would actually land in the anvil to improve um, that they actually would form that B-shaped staple that we're all looking for. And as other speakers have mentioned, they come in multiple sizes to help us pick the right sized staple for the right tissue. Now Medtronics, which is formerly Covidian or even before that Tyco, um, also has updated their staple loads as well as moving towards a powered stapler. From their internal literature, uh, what they tout as the advantages of their staple cartridges is each row of their staples have a different height. So the further away you get from the blade, the staple gets bigger, um, which they will say based on their internal literature allows better vascular ingrowth into the staple line. Plus uh, they have a wider range of staple heights. But when they went to get a powered handle, um, what they found, and this is again, purely based on their internal data, nothing of this is peer reviewed. They say that they found based on their internal data that they required fewer clips to achieve hemostasis as compared to a manual handle. And that when they put the powered handle into multiple surgeons hands, there was less stapling variability from surgeon to surgeon than when they put a manual handle into surgeons hands. However, their initial powered handle, the iDrive, had two real disadvantages. It had a very heavy battery and it really only had one speed. You hit the fire button and it fired from the bottom to the tip of the staple load on one speed and one pressure. So they did uh, multiple studies. And what I want you to really focus on is this column. When they fired it on extra thick tissue and it went on that one speed, what they found is when the stapler went really fast, they had a high rate of staple misfires and the pressure went up very significantly. On the other hand, when they sort of broke the stapler and allowed it to go at different speeds, when they allow the stapler to slow down, in fact, the rate of staple misfires goes down and the pressure goes down. And as a result of data like this, this is what allowed them to develop the Signia drive and what they call their adaptive firing technology, which encompasses a strain gauge. And so now, if they have average tissue thickness, they can allow it to run at a fast speed with a low misfire rate and an acceptable pre uh, force applied to the tissue. But as the tissue gets thicker, the, the stapler actually slows down. And when you get to extra thick tissue, it slows down a lot. And so your staple misfire rate goes down, the pressure being applied to the tissue goes down. And this is, um, again, based on their internal literature, should be safer to the tissue that we are firing. In addition, the battery got smaller. And then the final powered stapler that we can have available to us would be the Da Vinci. 
Now, the Da Vinci is going to tell us that the biggest advantage is that is a 100% controlled by the surgeon stapler. You're sitting at the console, you have complete control of it. The other staplers, depending on which trocar you put it through, your first assistant might be firing it for you. They may not even be a surgeon. It could be a surgical first assist. It could be a PA. It could be a nurse practitioner. Whereas this is going to be fired by the surgeon in an ergonomic fashion, and it uh, cross works for either of their platforms. Um, it has the greatest degree of articulation because it can reticulate in 60 degrees in any direction. And it also has the ability to monitor the tissue compression both before, during firing and make adjustments during the firing, up to a thousand measurements per second, according to the manufacturer. And all of this, according to the Da Vinci manufacturer, is going to go into a consistent staple line. Um, it will also warn you if you are trying to fire it on too thick a tissue and will actually stop you from firing. As the previous speaker uh, pointed out, if you're doing this manually and you actually go to use two hands, you should really think about that. It probably means your tissue is too thick. The Da Vinci will actually not let you fire. It will physically stop you. You can push on that foot pedal all you want and it's not going to fire for you. But let's talk about what's in the literature. Actually, there's only one really good article in the peer reviewed journal that I could find out of Japan from 2015 that was published in SWORD, really looking at the differences between manual handles and power handles and what it does to stapler configuration. They took porcine small bowel and they fired it with a plastic bag in the stapler. And then they dissolved the bowel in sodium hydroxide after they fired it. And they compared four groups, manual with a pause, manual with no pause, powered with a smooth firing, and powered with a gradual firing. And they evaluated the number of misfired staples. Basically, a zero score is a perfect B-formed staple. You can't see the little hooks of the stapler at all. Whereas one, two, three, and four, you see more and more of the little tails of the staple, like this. Now, basically, they looked at every staple on that piece of plastic, and group C is what we are looking at. And basically, group C formed stati performed statistically better than any of the other groups. It had the least number of malformed staples, and it had the least number of the grade three and four staples. And their conclusion was that deviation of the intestine within the stapler is what leads to the malformed staples. The more times you squeeze the handle or move the stapler, the more malformed staples you get. Therefore, a powered staple, stapler with smooth motion is going to lead to fewer malformed staples. And as Dr. Curian pointed out, there's actually very little peer reviewed literature. The next two studies I'm gonna share with you are actually open in open access journals. Neither of them are IRB and they're both database journals. And in fact, all of these authors have relationships with one of the major staple manufacturers. So you do have to worry about conflicts of interest. And in fact, the statistician for both of these articles is employed by one of the major uh, stapler companies. So you do have to have some caution in how you review the study. However, they did look at a major database that encompasses about 25% of US hospital discharges. And they looked at manual and powered staplers between gastric bypasses and sleeves. And they found a large number looking um, in both of these groups. But essentially what they found when looking at the lat gastric bypass patients is there was essentially no outcome difference between length of stay, total hospital cost, OR time bleeding, or readmission. In fact, the only difference was total hospital cost in the laparoscopic sleeve group. Now, there were some differences in that the majority of the powered staple used one manufacturer and the majority of the manual staple used a different manufacturer, probably related to purchase price. Now, um, this this article used the same database and the same statistician, but otherwise had different authors. And it attempted to look at matched patients, again, using sleeves. I'm sorry, this was a two-year study. That should be a number one. Between Ethicon powered stapler and the Medtronics stapler. 
And this was um, a multivariable regression analysis where they attempted to um, look at different, uh, eliminate the differences based on patient data, hospital differences, um, and surgeon characteristics. And the only statistically significant difference was there was a difference between the Ethicon product and the Covidian product when it came to bleeding outcomes. Um, however, the limitation of this database is that it really could only identify complications that happened at the index hospitalization. So once the patients were discharged, while it could look at readmissions, it could not identify why they were readmitted. And since we know most leaks are not necessarily identified on the first hospitalization, this is not really a good way to identify uh, differences in leak between um, staple manufacturers. Dr. Curian pointed out the differences um, between uh, that, that um, hand size is an issue. Um, and I also wanted to point out, I think the powered stapler, I think will probably be an issue. There's really only one article that I could find that tried to get to this issue. This was actually released online ahead of in print in American Surgical. And it's actually a survey that was done at the Japanese Society of Gastroenterological Surgery. And it was published two months ago in September. Um, and what they were attempting to look at, and um, the background is not necessarily um, written the way I would have preferred to have it written, but what they were trying to get to is the idea that female sur surgeons tend to have smaller hands and as a result may have a weaker grip strength. And therefore they hypothesized that we may prefer a powered a handle to deal with those issues. And I don't know that it's necessarily because we're female. It may simply be because of the smaller hands size. But they did a survey and they got 14 female surgeons and 21 male surgeons to answer the survey. But actually they asked questions both about manual linear staples and powered. And the first thing I thought that was interesting about this survey is 21% of the female surgeons said they actually liked nothing about the manual linear staple. They couldn't come up with one positive thing, which I think our manufacturing colleagues should actually pay attention to. Um, but they did dislike the handle size and the firing, which I think Dr. Curian pointed out. When they asked them about the powered staple though, Male and female surgeons liked the firing and the maneuverability that the powered stapler provided. And they disliked, I'm very sorry. I really thought I had that on. Um, what they disliked though was the weight and the weight balance. So even though the powered staplers have made improvements in their battery size and the weight of the handle, they still can be a problem. Now, Dr. Curian mentioned she knows at least one surgeon that only uses the powered stapler because of carpal tunnel, and I honestly don't know if she's talking about me or not. Um, if she's not talking about me, I become the case series of two, because several years ago, I actually got carpal tunnel in my dominant hand, and it was found to be a repetitive use injury from the manual stapler. Um, I'd gotten injections, I'd tried splinting, and then ultimately what ended up happening is I converted to the power stapler and within two weeks, everything resolved. And so I will not use anything but the power stapler if I have to fire more than one staple firing. And when I actually looked into it, what I found is the power staplers exert less force along the entire palmer surface of the hand. And so it makes sense that it is going to cause less repetitive use. We all have a limited life expectancy as surgeons. And just like the robot has advantages on our necks, our shoulders, and our backs, the powered stapler has advantages on our palms and our wrists. So in conclusion, while most of this is coming from the manufacturer's literature and not in peer reviewed, there does seem to be less mobility issues of the tissues with the powered stapler, which we suspect leads to less trauma. And there's at least one study supporting the economic benefits with the powered stapler on vertical sleeve gastectomy. And I would certainly propose that there are ergonomic issues with the manual handle that may be better 
uh, that may improve with the power handle for smaller hands. And this is certainly an area of potential research that I would encourage all our colleagues to be thinking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Corey. I, I highly appreciated your, your presentation. And, and the question that I would like to ask is uh, that you already gave the answer. Uh, you prefer powered uh, stapling device. That's, that's uh, what I understood. Uh, but, uh, and and you, you mentioned it, there's only one uh, study from Japan that showed powered has a better staple formation. And I think it's absolutely logic. So you would uh, recommend uh, that we, we, should, we should more enforce a powered stapling devices because it's a better outcome. I really do. I mean, I only have experience with one of the manufacturers because in my hospital, you know, we, we, we have we stick to one. I think this is a, an area that obviously needs to be researched and ideally we should be doing the research, not necessarily with manufacturer support because all of the, the majority of what I could find is industry sponsored. Um, but I think we need this in our peer reviewed literature, but all of the evidence I can find is there's less staple misfiring with powered. The staplers are better, the staples themselves are better formed. There's less tissue trauma. There's less movement of the staplers in tight spaces. There's less, um, and as a result, I mean, it does seem logical that there should be less bleeding. There should be less tissue trauma. There should be less, you know, shear um, on the tissues themselves. Um, then when you, add, when you add this sort of adaptive technology that the manufacturers are putting in, when it can give you that feedback that you've selected a tissue, a staple load that's too small for what you're trying to do. And I was actually gonna save it for the panel, but um, Dr. Raj, you know, he mentioned that, you know, when you feel it and it feels too tight, but I also think there's an audio feedback. And when you've been doing this long enough, when you start firing it, whether it's manual or power, and it's working too hard, you can hear that and you can hear it on the manual and you can hear it on the powered. And all of us who have been doing this more than a couple of years, you know that it's working too hard and you can stop, back up, upsize your staple load. And that comes with experience, but we also should be training our trainees that if it, whether it's manual or powered, if it's starting to work too hard, stop, back up, and upsize your staple load to decrease your risk of a misfire. You mentioned one very, very important uh, thing that's uh, a possibility to do interrupted firing, uh, especially in, in revision surgery where you have a very thick uh, tissue, a scar tissue, etc. But what I recommend is when you have an atraumatic grasp, you can estimate very, very well by experience the thickness of, uh, of the stomach wall. And Raj showed one uh, very, very important uh, video where the staples were not even deployed, were still in the machine. That's an absolute clear sign that the tissue was too thick. So the staples did not even reach the anvil. And who was blamed? The industry. Who was blamed? The stapler. But in principle, it was the wrong cartridge for the wrong tissue. And, and that is uh, sometimes where we are confronted uh, when, when we have to identify videos, is this the machine or is this the misuse? And uh, the 2020 ECRI report of the 10 major uh, failures in surgery, number one was misfiring of, of staples. And that's also from the FDA, the letter to the industry where more than 30,000 uh, misfirings were reported to the FDA. But no one really focused on the proper use, on the misuse. And Raj and, uh, and, uh, 
and Dr. Uh, Ekre, it, it, it's really great to, to see such uh, great and distinguished uh, lectures. But I think for the, for the sake of time, I, hand, I have to hand over, I have to hand over to Ariel because uh, we, we could discuss so many things. And, and I think that today's uh, presentations and lectures are really crucial uh, for our patient's outcome. And the perfect use of a stapler is ensuring uh, a better outcome for our patients. And, and thank you very much uh, you. For, your, for your excellent uh, lecture, Professor Corey McBride. I really appreciate it. And Ariel, I think I hand over to you. It's your turn. <laughs> thank you, Carl. And, and thank you, Professor Corey McBride. Uh, spectacular talks today, and we're definitely getting that feedback from our online viewers right now, since this is a live stream through all of the IBC um, platforms uh, on the value of this content. This, this is extremely important. A lot of surgeons are actually uh, congratulating uh, this team of experts on their presentations. And going to our next topic, this uh, talk will be surgical stapling technology in the 22nd century. And our next speaker is Professor of Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard University, President-elect of IFSO, President past president of the American Society of Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and he is editor-in-chief of Obesity Surgery. He is a friend to IBC, a personal friend. He is uh, also an esteemed colleague and an honorary member of IBC, and of course, a legend in our field, Professor Scott Shikora. Thank you very, very much, Ariel, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm speechless. Let me see if I could share this. So uh, I was asked to speak about surgical stapling in the 22nd century. So keep that in mind. That's very, very interesting. It's a look way down the road in the future. Here are my disclosures and uh, Medtronics, I do need to mention, I've always worked at hospitals that had the Medtronic devices and I've been a consultant and have spoken for them and received honoraria many times over. I don't think it's gonna uh, impact my talk. So as you've seen through this, and I have to say, I have to agree with uh, Charlie and with Ariel that uh, you guys have been a tough act to follow with those wonderful presentations. But the stapling device was a game changer in GI surgery. And I don't know who on the panel recalls the days when you didn't use staplers. I remember during early residency where you would free up the stomach, you would put two huge clamps on it, cut between with a scissor or a scalpel, and then hold the clamps together as you stitched. And how many leaks did we have in bed and anastomoses from that type of technology? And look at what we do now with the stapling device, almost routine. And uh, it clearly has made surgery more precise, uh, quicker, fewer complications. And as you've been getting a flavor of, these devices are continuing to evolve into better and better and better a lot of it because we've told industry what we've needed. So I'm going to take you into the future. Some of it is my own guesswork, but uh, maybe you'll find it interesting. But let me start off with this. So you asked me to speak about what's going to happen in the 22nd century. Well, we're only 20 years into the 21st century. So we're looking at at least 80 years from now. And as you know, with centuries, 100 years, so we're looking between 80 and 180 years from now. So my questions in regard to that, will surgery still exist 150 years from now? Will anyone need bariatric and metabolic surgery? And if yes, will any of us be around to see it? And I don't think the answer to that is too difficult. In any event, as uh, Marina mentioned, uh, it's a misconception that surgical stapling started in the Soviet Union around the time of World War II. It in fact predates it by over a hundred years. And this was probably the first device used in surgical uh, anastomosis. And this was the Denim's cylindrical stent from the early 1800s that was placed within the two cut edges of the bowel of a dog. And somehow the device was secured and it healed. 
And it reminded me a little bit about the magnets that some of the endoscopists have been putting down in the small bowel that creates anastomosis by holding everything together until it necroses and seals. And that's what this device was. Now this device was not actually a stapling device, but I thought it was interesting because it was the use of a device in surgery. Now, as Marina mentioned, the first stapling devices were actually attributed to the Hungarians, not to the Russians. That comes a little bit later. And the very first one was the Humer Hudel device of the early 1900s. And uh, Hudel was the chief of surgery at one of the local hospitals. And he was a real stickler for uh, antisepsis he also really, really tried to prevent GI spillage, thinking that that was the uh, root of all evils when it came to G abdominal infections. And Victor Fisher was a gentleman whose family was five generations of surgical equipment makers and device makers. So Hoodle went to Fisher because he had this idea in mind of creating some type of a mechanical instrument that could place rows of staples and prevent leakage. And they came up with that device. This is what it looks like. And unless you're an engineering expert, I'm not sure I truly understand the description, but there was a crushing staple forceps with a cogwheel, a gear rod, and a moving crankshaft constructed to deliver quadruple rows of U-shaped steel wire staples. So I honestly don't exactly know how that device worked, but there was a wheel of some sort that was turned and that drove the staples into the tissue. And it was used for the very first time in 1908 and was very popular. And the, it was a heavy device. It was a little bulky and a little difficult to set up. And that then uh, spurred Dr. Aladar von Petz, also Hungarian, probably a disciple of uh, Hudel, to create a lighter version called uh, the uh, Jan Pet stapler. Now this one was lighter, had only two rows of staples and German silver is not silver. It's actually an alloy of copper, nickel and zinc, but that was the material that was used for the uh, clips as they called it. And this was about uh, 10 years after the very first stapler. Now the Germans have for a very long time been involved with instrument making and the first German stapler was produced by Heinz, Dr. Heinz Friedrich and Heinrich Ulrich. Ulrich being uh, an instrument maker and obviously uh, Fr Frederick, Frederick the surgeon. And this had a removable cartridge. And instead of having to turn a wheel to drive the staples, <clears throat> this one actually you squeeze the handles. Now, if you look at that device, it's starting to look familiar. It looks to me like the old TA-90B stapler that we used in bariatric surgery for open gastric bypasses and VBGs. So we're getting closer. Now we can talk about the Russians. Around the time of World War II, the Russians became very interested in developing staplers for many uses, but mainly to be efficient for battle wounded. And they created an actual institute called the Scientific Research Institute of Experimental Surgical Apparatus and Instruments, where they were looking at designing all sorts of staplers for all different uses, whether it's thoracic, abdominal, et cetera. And I just took this picture of two of their stapling devices because this one reminds me of the old open GIAs. And this one looks very much like the TA-90B that I mentioned earlier. And these were Russian staplers. Now, sometime around the 1960s, Streichen and Mark Ravitch became interested in stapling and heard about the Russian stapling experience and went to the Soviet Union to observe some operations. And they got to see a couple of chest operations uh, using stapling devices, and they were very impressed. They, wouldn't, they weren't able to uh, be given a device at the hospitals, but by uh, complete uh, luck, they went out for dinner and across the street was a store that happened to sell a whole bunch of things, including a stapling device, a surgical stapling device that they bought for about 400 rubles. Now, I have no idea what 400 rubles are worth today, but they paid 400 rubles. 
And uh, Ravitch was really, really impressed with its device, but the problem was it was pretty much handmade. So the pieces were not interchangeable with other similar devices. And he felt that there could be a lot of change that could be done to these staplers to make them more efficient. So he partnered with a businessman, Leon Hirsch, and together they founded a company called United States Surgical Corporation or US Surge. And that was the original designer of some of these stapling devices in the US. And they spent about three years modifying the devices until they got them where they wanted. And they went live with it in 1967. Now here's a picture of their devices. And again, these look very, very familiar from what uh, we were using, particularly early on in my training. And as you heard, there's been uh, improvements made on a regular basis. You've heard some of this today. Devices went from those big bulky metal things to devices that articulate, that rotate, that you can place down a 12 millimeter port to do uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery. The ergonomics continue to improve. Different cartridge sizes for different jobs, such as using smaller staples, the two millimeter staples on vascular, larger staplers on small bowel, even larger staplers on antrum or uh, reoperative surgery. And all of that's available now. And all of this has made stapling more precise and safer. You saw some pictures of bad staple lines. Well, this is a very bad staple line that obviously has a high risk of, uh, of leakage, not healing correctly. And the staples were very poorly formed compared to this staple line where the staples look like little soldiers, they're lined up perfectly and the staples were well uh, compressed. I think that we're getting to the point where the stapling devices and the uh, staples are becoming so good that we probably can do away with buttressing and oversawing altogether. And the tri-staple technology, in my opinion, although it was only from one company, was also an advance in staple technology because it makes sense to me that if the inner staples are a little bit smaller and bite down a little bit tighter, uh, at the anastomosis where the cut edge is, where I think the tissue is likely the thinnest, you should have a better result than if all the staples were the same size and when you uh, close the gun, crimp down to the same uh, height. I think that having alternate uh, uh, staple line rows of different heights makes a lot of sense in my mind. I'm not gonna spend time talking about the powered instruments, I think they're probably an advantage to the non-powered instruments, but as Corey brought out, we don't have all the literature and all the data yet. They can be fired with one hand. They are very uh, good for reticulating, rotating, getting into places you couldn't get into before. The real-time feedback with pressure and speeds and everything you've heard are said to reduce bleeding and OR time, but I think, again, the literature can be uh, better than we currently have to answer those questions. And as you can see, all three companies, major companies have stapling devices, and there's a number of other companies that are producing either knockoff stapling devices or their own unique stapling devices. So I spent a lot of time, I did everything but talk about the future. So what is the future? Well. I think we'll see the continued development of staples that have better uh, staplers that have better reliability, repeatability, ergonomics, and less complications, less bleeding, less leakage. I think that we're gonna see customized algorithms that optimize staple formation. So the, you put into the uh, computer, some computer generated uh, stapling device, settings for what you want based maybe on the type of operation you're doing or the tissue you're doing, and the guns will be adjusted accordingly. They already have the closed loop sensing for pressure and thickness, and I think that that will continue to get better with time. I think we're going to eventually have sensors that analyze tissue perfusion at the tip of the staple line, to, or anastomosis to let us know whether the tissues are heal, will heal or whether we need to cut the back a little more to tissue with better perfusion. 
And I think there may be a time where we're not looking at metal staples anymore. We're looking at some type of polymer that may dissolve or maybe no staples at all, or maybe a device that actually welds the tissues closed as opposed to stapling them. I think that there'll be a continued evolution as surgeons continue to say, this is what we need, this is what we want. And I think the next great move is gonna be into artificial intelligence and machine learning where the, as the operation goes, the devices are collecting data from how the operation is going that's going to adjust how they continue to operate. And the machine should get smarter as the case goes on, or maybe as multiple cases are done, the machine collects all that data from all the cases and gets smarter uh, more universally. This, it's also possible that we may see something like in the auto industry now where the surgeon doesn't really operate on the patient. The surgeon goes to a keyboard and puts in a, an algorithm or a, or a command and the robots do the operation without the, the surgeon being actively involved with it, that it's all done, it's all automated. And the integration of sensors to create volumes of data that can then give more insight into the procedures and improve outcomes. So it may very well be a time we're not that involved with the surgery other than we're watching how the robots are doing. Or we may see something like this from Star Trek. The patient is uh, evaluated with some device like the old tricorder. Uh, blood work can be done by just looking at a test tube with your eyeballs and you can tell what the CBC is and the PT and everything else. The surgeon doesn't have to scrub at a scrub sink, but just put this green goo on their hands. This is the operating room. And as you can see, there's no ports, choke cars. Uh, Dr. McCoy here is only just plugging in some information. The operation is being done totally by the machine. And then about three hours later, you go back to work. So in conclusion, surgical stapling devices have become indispensable for many types of surgeries. And since its inception in the early 1900s, these devices have evolved and continue to evolve and become safer and more reliable. In the future, we can expect continued mechanical improvements, but also I think artificial intelligence, uh, more sensors and more autonomy to the device itself. Unfortunately, I don't think any of us will be there to see it. And I want to thank Ariel and Tom, uh, Phil Schauer, uh, Harris, for inviting me to be part of such a great panel and to give a talk that's actually was more fun than hard work. Thank you very much. Professor Carl. Carl? Yep. Are you me? <laughs> no. I think Billy is on the way now. Is, is there any question for, for future of stapling? I, I, uh, I don't know, because the only, the only comment what I would like to have is no one mentioned at all about the, all the uh, experimental studies on uh, that the stapled anastomosis had a bad uh, microvascular invasion than uh, hand soon. If, uh, if you are not very familiar, because I started in 1990, as you can see with the first papers, uh, comparing hand soon versus uh, stapled anastomosis and ended up then in double stapling technology in disease of colon and rectum, uh, 1996. So that's just a, a little sidestep that uh, hand soon anastomosis has less microvascular invasion, but however, uh, we are all aligned that um, basically uh, stapling has uh, the better and is much easier in, in handling also for the surgeon. Also, for the sake of time, I think uh, you want to hand over to, to Billy because I would like to congratulate uh, Scott for his 
a wonderful excursion from history to future. Uh, I, I think there's nothing to add from my side because it was an awesome uh, overview of, of that. What, what would you like to ask is, is that why, <laughs> why we, why we uh, waited so long until we have really a, a stapling device that for, forms a perfect uh, staple. We are just aware of that because we, we are still uh, having the problems of misusing, misfiring, and, and that means we, we still don't have the perfect device. We still need our uh, skills, we still need our uh, brain, and that I think, Scott, you brought up perfectly. Uh, uh, an, an artificial intelligence would avoid tissue tension before firing, would avoid uh, too, too uh, thick tissue, would avoid rotating your staple before you fire, would avoid uh, the wrong staple hate, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, uh, Scott, you brought a, a perfect insight what will be needed uh, in, in future. And I think it's really the industry that should have heard your presentation and act and work on that, especially uh, to, to get resolvable staples. Why not? Uh, the, the only thing is it's not, not impossible. Nothing is impossible as we have seen from the last 100 years in development of stapling devices. I would agree. I'm thinking in my mind, you have a way to map the abdomen on a, your pre-op patient whether it's during the surgery or whether it's beforehand somehow. And that information goes into a computer that then figures out where to start the cut, where to start taking vessels down, what to staple, what to sew. And the computer can do the whole operation with you just basically making sure that uh, nothing goes wrong. Uh, absolutely. But before that, the computer can tell you, you have to dissect more, you have to be clear, uh, your, your tissue is under tension. So that is what I call uh, uh, the, the safety checklist before firing. That, that is something we should start implementing uh, in, in, in our everyday's work. Agreed. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much. Scott, and let's go on and uh, proceed to uh, our panel of experts, which we have a great world-class panel of experts today with us. And they're going to be discussing laparoscopic staplers from around the globe, balancing quality with cost. And to introduce the panel of experts, again, it's going to be Professor Scott Shikora, and I'm also honored to present Tom Rogula, our president and fo founder. So I'll pass it on to you guys. Uh, thank you, Ariel. This is my great honor. Uh, absolutely outstanding uh, meeting today. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce our best uh, experts in, in laparoscopic uh, surgery, uh, Dr. Spank uh, Zhang from China, and Rogers from the United States, Mohammed uh, Al Haifi from Kuwait, uh, Colin Miller from Austria and UAE, uh, Teresa McMaster from USA, Almino Ramos from Brazil. Uh, Hassan uh, Hassin uh, uh, Jamanech from Jordan, sorry about this pronunciation, and uh, Estuardo Bajens from Guatemala. And the theme of um, that panel discussion is balancing quality with cost. Uh, so I think uh, the main question is, uh, is there any chance we can uh, look for cost savings without um, losing quality. Um, so I, I would start from my own experience. Uh, I start using different staplers uh, from, from different uh, producers. Uh, and I, to my honesty surprise, I, I found them equally good uh, as other staplers uh, with some uh, cost uh, savings. Of course, we all are very um, concerned about quality. We don't want to take any risks uh, to compromise quality. That's why we probably, all of us stick into one or two staplers, but there's alternatives around. So what do you guys think? Well, if I can make an opening <clears throat> comment, I fully agree with you. Cost is an issue and we always need to look to make sure that we're being as cost effective as possible, but we have to look at a bigger picture. 
let's say for instance that the typical stapler costs 100 US dollars and the new one that has much better features that reduces complications proven is $200. You would say, all right, well, uh, I mean, I can get the one that's very good for $100, it'll save money, but will it save money? What does a leak cost? What does a bleed cost? What does a readmission cost? So if you can reduce the leak rate, even though you're paying more money for the device, it may be in the long run cost effective. So you have to factor that and keep that in mind. What's the big picture? A very good point, uh, Scott. I, I completely agree. Um, but how about if we have a very similar quality of, of two different staplers with a significantly lower cost? So this is what, what I think we all of us we, we hope uh, to uh, finally get some, some competition uh, in the market. So that can result with, with some cost savings. Um, is there any room to, to save? Uh, I don't know, technology, maybe it's too expensive to, to make this cheaper. What, what do uh, you guys think? May, may I jump into that topic? Because uh, uh, Scott uh, started with a, a bigger picture. And I would like to jump in that bigger picture. Uh, absolutely. You, you realize that uh, we do have uh, companies that copy paste uh, very well established stapler and most probably they have the same results uh, and you will not prove it because you need 100,000 patients to, to get really uh, significant differences. But what, what you have to address is that, uh, let's say, very well established companies like Medtronic and, and Eticom, they invest also in education, in development, in research. Those are the copy paste companies not doing. They just take a product, copy and sell it for, for much uh, cheaper uh, money. And, and, and that is something which ethically I would never accept. When I say uh, a company is investing in education, in training, and, and et cetera, uh, that, that is something where I say uh, I would support rather the $100 uh, instead of, uh, of the, the cheaper device. Uh, and if the $200 with a better outcome is, is from that uh, company who is supporting uh, training, education, and quality control. And that is also something which, which copy-paste companies uh, don't do. This quality control was very well also uh, focused today uh, that only very well established companies are able to do studies, even if they are financed by them. But uh, for instance, I give you the example of Eticon. They have seven uh, studies, comparative studies, while uh, other copy paste companies uh, will not have this uh, luxury. And that we also have to address that quality will cost. In addition, I have to I have to stop because when I when I go to uh, hospitals and I see um, that the directors of those hospitals they are driving Mercedes, they are driving BMW, they are not driving Chinese cars. Sorry to say. <laughs> so now I'm finished. <laughs> and we have and we have heard how how much, uh, for instance, Toyota had to pay in U.S. on penalty because of malfunction of their brakes. And that is what I what I would like not to have in a in a in a stapling device, not even in a single patient where I say because uh, that is uh, happened of a of a of a malfunction uh, stapling device. Can I jump in? It's Marina. I I just uh, uh, Charlie. I appreciate that passion. But you know, I I had the opportunity to work with Lexington Medical, which is a uh, uh, based off of um, the original. I think. Uh, Medtronic or U.S. Surgical oh, stapler off patent, and the staplers, the staples worked very well. I, I didn't receive money from them. Um, we did it as a study for our institution to see if we were able to have any cost improvement off the existing staplers that we had. Um, and the stapler formation was excellent. They even had better ergonomic handles than the original companies, and I think that it, it, while you're saying about these copy and paste companies, you have to look at what each individual company is doing. Perhaps there's a lot of them that are rushing to make these staplers. And I've seen some when I've given lectures in Latin America and in other um, 
parts of the world that there are other staplers that are out there. Uh, but some of the companies do have studies and have had, um, uh, I think, pretty well-known surgeons. And I, I know uh, Dr. Billy was going to talk about some of that as well when he was originally on the panel. So um, I, I don't want to lump all of them together. I think that there are some, and I'm sure Dr. Zhang Peng is going to tell us about some as well, um, that, that have put the effort in and are moving past the original patent that they that has come off of the restriction and the stapling and is being innovative. And I think that we have to accept that and not, and, and you know, um, also Corey, Corey said something about the robotic stapler um, that, you know, those, I, I remember I reviewed a paper basically on the robotic stapler that early on in their series that they had some misfires. So I think we have to be cautious. And, and as you said, we have to look at the data that the companies are presenting, but also use our judgment. And, and, and if we're going to trial something, do it as a trial and really examine it. Thank you. If I may, Scott, if I may, thank you. I have been involved in bariatric surgery since 21 years ago, and I know all the brands that exist. For me, uh, a good staple, not, we don't have to say perfect, has a very good quality and cost, easy to fire, less expensive, secure, safe, and ergonomic. I do agree with Marina. In the last year, I have been using the Lexington in more than 100 cases of bypasses and, and sleeve gastrectomies, and they are not giving me any money, but they are less expensive. Let me say, Carl, a cartridge here for me in Guatemala is 500 US from the other two companies. A cartridge here for me is $225. So if we are talking in a third world country, if we are talking about uh, quality and cost, that's why I'm, I'm using this. Mm. Ethican, Medtronics, they are excellent. I love them, but they're expensive for my patients and for me. So now we found this, this uh, opportunity, so we're using it. So uh, I do agree with Marina, they have a lot of investigation, they have a lot of uh, new uh, standards. They have two qualities for, for firing, thick mode, standard mode that the other brands don't have. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree to you and, and, that's, and that's unfortunately life. Uh, we have companies that are doing research, that are doing education, that investing in training, and they're investing in quality. And then there are companies that copy it and, and deliver it uh, cheaper. So we have to decide what we use. Uh, absolutely, I fully agree to you. Yeah. Try so I'd like to just add a component um, that I haven't heard anybody mention is part of cost and quality um, is consistency and reliability. And that's really key. So if another stapler can be uh, less costly, but very, very reliable, that, that's outstanding. I think innovation does drive improved cost, competition improves uh, cost. Um, one of the things we have to worry about in the US is oftentimes an institution mm -hmm. to a surgeon what they have to use. And anytime you're changing between tools, every tool has its own learning curve, has its own unique features. And so you have to be extra cautious, a very heightened sense of awareness when you're switching companies, when you're switching uh, tools. If you use it the same way, you will not have the same result at the very beginning. You really need to study, become a student of that tool and learn how to use that tool. And I think that's where a lot of misadventures come when, when places are, are switching, um, with not just staplers, could be energy, other things, is that um, they may be equivalent in a bench study but in a surgeon's hand that has used something else for a very long time, it's not going to be equivalent the very first time out. So just keeping that in mind that every tool has its own unique learning curve as well. And that's a part of cost too. If you, if you have it misfire four times the first case you're using it, you, you probably need more training on that before you're going to use that device because that does increase costs. So back to Carl's point about investing in training appropriately, investing in those things is, is important as well. And I have to throw one more last line in for ergonomics. I agree with everybody who talked about ergonomics that it's not 
focused on enough and not taken seriously enough. And that is a part of cost too, that our institutions never give back to us is the ergonomics and the, the strain on us. So that, that's my little two cents. If I can just add to what Carl said, uh, Charlie said his a point, a point was extremely important. Should we be paying a little bit more for the equipment of the companies that support our education? We could not hold our clinical congresses and our conferences and even this without their money. So the big three, for instance, give us a lot of money for our education, but then charge more than a copy company. Should we support the big guys who are supporting us? I don't have the answer. Well, I realize I'm not on the panel, but to Teresa's point, when we talk about training people to use these instruments, it's not just the surgeons, it's our scrub techs that load these instruments. And, you know, it's making sure our scrub techs know how to load the cartridge onto the stapler before they hand it to me. Because as someone pointed out earlier, you know, when it's three o'clock and I now have the ophthalmology scrub tech who doesn't know how to load the cartridge, I think I'm much more likely to have a staple misfire than when I had my A team. All right. I, uh, I, I have a, a few comments about the stapler. I uh, totally agree with everyone, especially Teresa. Uh, now, there, there, the stapler market is now is really competitive. There are, there are a lot of innovations, not only ASICON, Medtronic doing innovation, almost every company is doing innovations. And, uh, and uh, they use some uh, like smarter sensor to sense the tissue thickness, to adapt to the tissue thickness for the fine speed. It makes the stapler more ergonomic. I mean, uh, now this... Uh, that make it make stapler more and more reliable and cost effective and more economic. And if the if the company makes the product more and more expensive, it might not be innovation. It's it's, it's just like a market plan. That's the the outcomes quite similar. If the price triples the price or even like a, uh, four hundred times the price, that's not uh, might not be an innovation. It's just like a market plan. Now the goal for the uh, stapler, you know, we as a surgeon want to have no leakage, no bleeding, no obstruction. Now most of the time, leakage, bleeding, and obstruction not really to the stapler itself. It's it, it's really to the surgeon's technique and uh, scrap tax technique, and also really to the tissue properties. And uh, now you know, it's like you drive a car from San Francisco to Boston, uh, you the goal is drive there safely and on time. You can either drive Porsche car or you always drive a Corolla, uh, Corolla car, it doesn't matter. Um, as long as you drive there safely and on time, but you have better kind of feel more comfortable on that. So that for, for both cars, you can have car accident. Car accident, the car accident is probably not related to your car. It's related to how you drive your car and how other persons drive the car. And it also relies, uh, depends on the road condition. So I, I mean, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's most of, most of the time the, the bottom line that we need to the training and the practice the vital. The for instance, like you know, how you choose your you, you have to know your stapler and how you choose stapler and how to use it is more important than the, that the, like a Porsche or the Corolla. The difference of Porsche or Corolla. I mean, uh, that's my opinion and. Uh, now, even from for myself, the you know, power stapler is more popular, but I still prefer to a manual one, especially for difficult tissue. You now you can sense the tissue uh, property by yourself. You know you can predict outcome of your fire. And uh, for the another innovation, I want to mention about, about stapler that probably in future we we probably need a stapler that need a smaller choker, right? That's more benefit to patients, smaller choker. That's the direction. Even the stapler without choker, probably that should be the future innovation. Now, I mean, uh, I mean, currently, based on my understanding, the quality of the all the staplers, especially like Essica Medtronic, is good enough, early enough. You don't have to spend too much time and too much effort to improve the one percent better than the current status. I, I mean, uh, probably that's not not worth it. All right, so uh, I think it's an interesting question coming from uh, our viewers from YouTube and Facebook. 
uh, about the re reusable uh, handles of the staples. Maybe uh, this is where we can save some. Uh, how about uh, our other experts, uh, Dr. Emino Ramos, uh, Hassan, Mohammed, and Anne? What do you guys think? Uh, maybe we can reuse the handles. I, I can jump in uh, sure. as long as no one. Uh, you cannot re-sterilize. You can re-clean uh, it. You can uh, re-decontaminate it, but you cannot re-sterilize a disposable. And when I read that uh, you can use it in five patients, uh, then I would say uh, I would not. I would not take the responsibility, even if you are in a very low uh, economic uh, situation. I rather would do than hands on whatever, but but to to use a disposable five times, uh, I, I doubt that you, that it's really safe. And uh, and Dr. Bank, I really apologize if if I got it in the wrong direction. I do not want to insult anyone regarding the copy paste thing. Please uh, understand that I'm just emotional because I'm a trainer and an educator since since 30 years in surgery. And, and, and I know how important it is when, when companies are supporting training and investing in training and in research. So uh, that is the reason why I was a little bit emotional. I do not want to, I do not want to insult uh, uh, Chinese products. Please uh, do not misunderstand me. <laughs> I'm very sorry if that came in the wrong way. I'd like to add something to that as well. Um, I have not had experience, first of all, reusing the handles, but I can tell you that I've gone through an evolution in my practice, as many as, of us have, especially early in the sleeve gastrectomy experience. And one of the significant problems with one of the major companies was the blade was just not strong enough, especially when there were times you had to come across staple lines. And they would just tell you, well, that's just misusing the stapler because you're not supposed to go across staple lines. But to make that sleeve perfect, sometimes that's what you need to be able to do. So eventually they did catch up on their technology better. But I think this is something, um, depending on the technology, um, it's not designed for multiple uses. And there's a lot of torque from the abdominal wall on these devices that can cause them to deviate from the way they were designed with multiple uses. So um, I, I truly understand that sometimes in a cost situation, you have to look for every advantage you can, but you have to understand what you're giving up to. And that may be, you're not getting the consistency and reliability that you think you get because it wasn't designed for reuse. And maybe the companies can change that material science so that it is designed for reuse. But I would suggest that the current staplers are not designed for reuse so that you're adding a stress that was never studied or intended for that instrument. So it's something to think about. Yeah, so another question is maybe the savings is also in that famous last firing of the staple when you do sleeve. It's very tempting sometimes just to take a chance and see what happens. I don't do this, I just want to lose that stapler all the way up uh, and just use one centimeter of that stapler just to make sure it fire, fires all the way uh, to the end. Uh, what do you guys think, Almino? Uh, what do you do with this last firing of the sleeve? Of the sleeve? Is Almino here? Mohammed. How, how you guys do this with, this with this famous last firing? Are you taking chance or not? Yeah. Uh... Go ahead, I mean. Uh, Hassan, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think it all depends on, on how far the stables are placed. If the stable line is complete and there is only this tiny part of the tissues which, which you know that it's just only hanging the, 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 the stomach, I most of the time go with my scissors, making sure that I'm not cutting it through unstable tissue. You know, there is a safety margin between the last stable and the knife movements, and this safety margin should not be uh, taken. Uh, I think I have submitted two or three videos uh, about this issue, and I have seen a lot of uh, non-agreement about this, but it all depends about the, the judgment of the surgeon. 
So whenever the, the stable line is complete and you know that, that's, that there is nothing more to stable, I think that that would be safe, but it's only a very personalized situation. Right, right. Okay, is there any speaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, yeah. It's a very fascinating discussion. Uh, now we're talking about a device uh, that a uh, patient's life almost completely rely on. So this is one of the most important topics for, for all of us. Unfortunately, time is up. Uh, we don't have um, much time to, to continue. I would encourage you to go uh, to our Facebook and YouTube channel and continue the discussion with the faculty. There's lots of interesting comments and questions. Uh, I want to thank you everyone for absolutely outstanding and enlightening discussion today. It opened a lot of uh, uh, you know, avenues to, uh, to explore, including that fascinating uh, futuristic uh, and also historical uh, perspective. Um, again, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to have you all. Thank you for your time. And as always, uh, please stay with us for next editions. Hope you enjoyed it. Ariel, back to you. This has been an IBC Oxford University Hot Topics in Surgery production. I want to thank my co-chairs, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. Don't forget to mark your calendars as the IBC Oxford University World Congress is taking place the 23rd to the 25th of September of 2021 in Oxford, United Kingdom. To view past Hot Topics events, go to ibcclub.org or any of our social media platforms. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. And now, let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. I've been a bariatric surgeon uh, since 1999, and over the last 20 years, it's grown uh, to where 80% of my practice is now bariatric, revisional, reversal. And so we meticulously examine staple lines. We obviously compared outcomes, but you have to do what, thousands of cases to see a, a leak rate, and we compared them. We would do one case with a new stapler, next case with an older stapler. We started to see outcomes that were not only acceptable, but on par. So it was important to me to meet the people that brought this to market. We were invited to the, to the corporate headquarters in Boston. Uh, not only are they designed there, but they're manufactured there, they're packaged there. Quality control is it's something I've never seen before. And so this company has allowed us to have actually more articulation than the competing platforms have. And you can position the articulation wherever you want. And more importantly, it stays there. One of the things I like is that it's ergonomic and it is in a design that we're all familiar with. Uh, you can control the rotation with one hand if you like. The buttons that accentuate the stapler being ready to fire are available on both sides. And we have this slow mode, fast mode that lets the surgeon design exactly how they want this stapler to be, be fired. Es la única que yo conozco que tiene dos modos de corte. Uno es estándar y el otro es grueso. Ellos le ponen aquí estándar y thick. Cuando tú lo pones, tú sientes una suavidad a la hora de estar haciendo el disparo. Sentir en mi mano qué es lo que estoy cortando. Y en este tipo de rapadora, cuando tú la pones en thick o en modo easy, se va de una manera muy suave. Hemos tenido la oportunidad, gracias a Dios hasta el momento, más de 100 casos no hemos tenido fugas. No hemos tenido sangrado. Changing this out does not require a big re-education of your operating room staff. And the articulation is very straightforward. We simply rotate it to what position. The only click that you'll feel is when it's back in the neutral position. That gives you the confidence that once the stapler is locked, it will stay. 
as more cartridge colors came out, we have an array of five, six different types of cartridges that allow us to go from quite thick black all the way down to vascular loads. As our case volume changed, as we started to do more complicated operations, we really depended on having more choice than one company would have over another. So you have confidence, you have ergonomics, you have familiarity. Very, very easy to incorporate this into a standard practice that currently is using staplers of the mechanical variety. Uh, so design innovation and achieving what surgeons are asking for is happening on a monthly basis with the size of the company able to do that. So I'm very, very happy with those unique features that have taken what we've all worked with for 20 years and brought them to a different level.